No, it would be like, boom, like, see you at the crossroads. You, I mean, I'm like, it would have done. Like, what happened to that kid, Ricky? Like, you know, he's like, I think he moved back to South Florida. We never saw him again. I mean, it, it would have been over, you know? And, and, and I mean, that's just an example. Like, times, though, these days have changed. And when we look at even stuff in, in Christianity with the culture that's happening, one of the things that I feel is changing is our hospitality. Um, you know, even back in, like Elena calls it, the olden days, uh, <laughs> which for her is the 1980s. Uh, you know, e even back in these times, I remember growing up as a kid, um, how people from the church would come over to our house just any day of the week to show up. And my mom would be like, hey, turn the TV off. We have, we have guests. We have company over. So turn it all off. And then they would make coffee. And it didn't matter what we had. It didn't matter who came at what time. It was always like this open door, this welcome. The hermanos from the church are here. And if they had a kid with them or a friend, then, then we were allowed to go outside or play Nintendo or, or you know, just, just leave us alone and so the adults could hang out and visit. But there was just this open revolving door of hospitality. It didn't matter what time, what day. You were always welcome in here. And I think that's just so rich. That, that's so, like, that's awesome. It doesn't even matter. I know, you know, Rachel is, is great with hospitality. And when we first got married, uh, our apartment was 550 square feet. Um, yeah, it was awesome. It was a, that's right, cozy little place of happiness. Um, but that didn't stop us. Like, we loved hosting people. We would have, like, the youth over our house, like, eight or nine of us in, in a small little apartment. Like, you throw a rock in the window, everybody has a bump on their head. I mean, it was like we were all, it was a small place. But we would host UFC fights. We have three guys on the couch, two on this side, four on the floor. Not everybody could move at the same time. But, but for us, like, we really enjoyed it. And we gave what we had. And it was like, if we only had crackers and peanut butter, we were going to hook up some peanut butter cracker sandwiches for you. For some of us, it was like, man, if you give me 15 minutes, I'll make you the, the greatest ramen ever. <laughs> Come on in. I got you. Like, I know if I go to Joey's house, he's going to hook me up with huevos con weenie. <laughs> no matter what. He might not have tortillas where he's Miss Baird's. It's all right. We use a piece of bread. I know if I go to his house, he's going to hook me up with that no matter what. See, like, so what I'm getting at here is I think some of us, we think hospitality has to do with the resources. But the truth is hospitality is about the resourcefulness of God and us trusting in his resource. And what I, what I worry is that our culture and our time, the time that we um, are living in, we've become so closed off. We've become so selfish. We've become so like all about me and my plans and like my money and my resource. We become so tight fisted that God is going to say, man, like there is a blessing in being hospitable. And there's actually a calling for us to be hospitable that if we don't let go of ourselves, we're going to miss it. Now, 1 John, in 1 John, we talked about, you know, John is, is pointing out this is what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. You love the truth. You have the anointing of God in you. You love the things of God. You, you know, you, are, you have righteousness in you. Then we go to 2 John, and 2 John talks about because of that righteousness that you have, we have a specific hospitality that we share. But when deceivers show up, don't let them take advantage of it. You better protect the truth. Don't help push that foolishness down the road. So defend it. But now we're getting to 3 John. And what 3 John is going to say is hospitality is awesome, especially when it comes to other believers, and especially if it's with other believers who are helping move the gospel forward. You better open your house to them because you too could be involved in the movement of God. And if you're not careful, you're going to miss it. And, I, and I, I, man, when I was reading this, I was like, man, this is so encouraging to me. I love this. 
But what I really hope that you guys take from today is that you leave here with a, a different sense of hospitality. Because I, I feel like we're, we're starting to lose it as a culture because we're so worried about our stuff and our plans and our schedules. When God is like, man, there's a gift in this. So we're going to look at eight verses today. Um, there's 13 verses in the book of 3 John. We're going to be here about three weeks, and then we're going to go do something else. So let's go look at verse uh, 1. So let's look at the first couple of verses. Oh, let's pray first. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we, we pray that you help us uh, understand your word, Lord. I pray that you help me, Father, to teach your word in its context, uh, that everything that comes out of my mouth is uh, pleasing to your ear. And you pray all these things, amen. So let's go ahead and jump in this thing. Look at verse 1 and 2. Uh, it says, the elder to my friend John, uh, my friend John, my friend uh, Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, as, um, even as your soul is getting along well. So let's go ahead and, and stop there because this is setting up the letter here. In verse 1, we know that John is the elder. He started the letter of 2 John with the same title. So he's, he's coming from a pastoral role as he's writing this letter out to his people. Now, who's the other character? Who is he writing this letter to? Well, it says, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Now, what do we know about Gaius? Because it doesn't really say much in this, this passage. But what we can do is we could look at some context clues in um, who this is. We know that Gaius was someone that probably came from, uh, that, that found Christ through John. He probably was discipled uh, from John. He's probably serving in a church that John helped start. We also know that the name Gaius is, is a Roman name. It's a Gentile name. So Gaius was actually used in the Roman culture. A lot of the males were named Gaius. Uh, so that was just kind of a normal name. But we also know that he was beloved by a lot of people, especially in the church. We know that he was really faithful. And we see that where he says, my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So what he's saying is that's something a believer says to another believer. You don't tell a, a non-believer that. So look at verse 2. My dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Now, we want to look at a proper translate, uh, a better translation here. It would read, I pray that, uh, that you may enjoy good health and that all may prosper with you. So that term, may go well, actually translates better into prosper. Now, how do I know this? Well, you got to do some word studies. So if you look at that word um, prosper, it actually reads in the text, it's, there's a, a Greek verb called eodoe, uh, which means to succeed. It means to have everything go well for you, to enjoy a favorable circumstance. But look, look what John is doing here. Because I don't want us to just walk over this, because there's a really important lesson in verse 2 here. I pray that everything, I mean, that you may enjoy good health and that it all might prosper with you, that all might go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well too, which also translates that your soul is prospering as well. See, what, what, what John is getting at is that Gaius is having some physical issues here. So we don't know if it's a sickness. We don't know if, if, if something happened to him physically. <clears throat> but what we do know is that John is saying, man, I, I really wish your health physically was as good as your spiritual health is right now. So he's alluding, he's trying to say, man, you're, you're rocking it spiritually. You're doing amazing, like everyone's talking about you. And, and man, we love to hear this, but you need to take care of yourself physically. 
So, I, so we don't really know what's happening here with guys, but what we do know is that John is trying to tell him, like, we want your physical health to be just as good as your spiritual health. Why is he saying that? Because he knows that if Gaius can serve God with an unrestrictive peace in his life, he could do so much for the service of the Lord and the church. Guys, God cares a lot about your spiritual health, but he also cares about our physical health as well. And I think that there's something that we miss a lot in, in the church. And, and, and just to kind of say just one more thing about this, as a pastor, you know, with, with John, as a pastoral desire, you know, you never want to see anybody in your, in your um, as you shepherd, go through physical pain or, or just, just kind of like being in and out of the hospital or, or go through surgeries. Like, that, that's difficult. That weighs on the heart of a pastor. So what we see here is that John is like, man, like, I really hope that you get better physically so that way you could continue to serve the God, serve your Lord effectively. So if you need some kind of motivation to take care of your health, for some of us, it's not a six pack. For some of us, it's not, I'm trying to get high school skinny. For some of us, it's not the summertime. Your motivation for being well physically should be to serve my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ better. To be more effective in that. To be more efficient in that. And I know this is something that I, I share a lot with people that I've decided that I, I'm going to make sure that my health is good the best I can make it because there's a lot I want to do. And if my health is not well, then I'm not going to be able to do it. So I got to keep up this energy somehow. All right, so that's verse 2. So he's, he's, he's telling his friend, guys, he's like, man, I, I'm praying for your health, and I hope that it's just as good physically as it is spiritually, so that way you can continue to serve the Lord, with in, not with any restrictions, that you keep going. And then look at verse 3 and 4. Now he's going to give them some props. And this is something that all of us can learn from. He goes, it gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Man, I love what John does here. So John, he, he, he talks, he's like, he welcomes the letter. He's like, hey, Gaius, like, this is your dear friend. Man, I hope everything's good with you. I know you're struggling physically, but my prayer is that you get better physically. It matches your, your, your spiritual health as well. And, man, I've been hearing some great things about you from other believers. People are talking about you. How do we know they're talking? Because it says they came and they testified about you. That word testified means that they've witnessed something. They didn't just hear it. They saw it. They've witnessed something about your faithfulness to the truth. Man, how many of us, like, isn't that what your story, isn't that what you want your story to sound like? Oh, man, that's like, if I leave this world, I would love someone to be like, man, the faithful, his faithfulness to the truth was incredible. It brought me so much joy. Like, can you say that? Like, this is something that should be so motivating. And then it's just telling how you continue to walk in it. All right, so look what John's about to do here. Because I want you to see what John did not say. So what John is saying is that it brought him great joy, <clears throat> in verse 4, to know that my children are walking in the truth. All right, look at verse 4. If you're going to circle something, you should circle walking in truth. Because what he's doing, he's, collect, he's connecting belief and conduct together. So he's not saying it brought me great joy to know that my children are believing. It brought me great joy to, that my children know the truth. He's not just saying knowledge. He's saying that you know and that knowing gets you to acting. 
So you don't, you're not just talking about it, you're actually being about it. How do you know somebody is truly transformed by the way that they live their lives? Anybody could give you the right answer. Anybody could fake it till you make it. You ask anybody the question, are you a follower of Christ? Do you believe in Jesus? And they'll give you the right answers. But what do their lives look like? And that's what John is getting at. He's like, man, it brings me so much joy that my children not only believe in the truth, but they believe to the point where it has changed their lives and they continually serve and they're continually walking in the truth. That's where the joy stems from. So I want us to be real clear that when we talk about truth, when we talk about faith, when we talk about Christianity, it's more than knowledge. It's more than knowing. It's again to the point where the Holy Spirit transforms your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit to live in and through you. And that's how you continue to live this Christian walk. And what John is saying is like, man, it, there's no greater joy in my life than for me to look at my children to see that they're walking in the truth. I know a few months ago when we were talking, I mean, as for parents, I mean, this is the cheat code right here. Like, this should be your prayer for your own kids. Like, your prayer for your children are not that they go, get into a great college. It's not that they find good work. It's not that they make a ton of money. Your prayer for your kids is that they grow up walking in the truth of God. That they grow up knowing Jesus and following his lead. Because if they get that piece right, everything else is going to fall into place. Everything else is going to be taken care of. This needs to be the focus of your life. And learning how to kick a soccer ball is not going to get you here. This is going to be through discipleship. And that comes from you, mom and dad. So, so we've got, got to really focus on this. And, I, and I'll, I'll say one more thing about this. I mean, that's why we're so passionate about kids and making sure that we teach them well. We saw this in Honduras. Like, we're like, we're going to focus on these kids because these kids are going to lead people to Christ. But they're also going to walk in the truth as they grow up. So there's no greater joy than to see that my children are walking in the truth of Christ. And then look at verse 5. Dear friend, we are faithful in what you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and the sisters, even though they are strangers to you. All right, so you're like, well, Ricky, I thought we were talking about hospitality. Keep coming. All right. So verse 5, he says it again. So he's talking to guys. He's like, man, you are faithful. All right, so when you tell somebody that they're faithful, that means that they do it more than one time. They're consistent with it. They do it the same time, just as good every single time. They're faithful in what you are doing for brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. Now, what I want to make sure that we look at here, too, he's talking about showing hospitality to his brothers and sisters who are other believers in the faith. Some of y'all are looking at me like, man, Ricky, you're talking about hospitality. People are crazy out there. I'm just not going to invite strangers in my house. Are you out of your mind? Understand the context. That's not what the context says. The context is talking about brothers and sisters in the faith in Christ. He's talking about even like preachers, people who disciple, teachers, people who are helping push the gospel forward. And even that you don't know them. You have been faithful in taking care of them. Look at verse 6. Because Paul's going to keep, I mean, uh, John's going to keep calling them out. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. Verse 7. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. And in verse 8. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that, they, so that we may work together for the truth. 
So John is telling Gaius, he's saying, hey, make sure that you send them out in a way that honors the Lord. Don't wing it. Don't blow it. Don't give them like whatever you got left in the house. You give them your best. You do what honors God. You make sure they're, good, they're well taken care of. Why? Because verse 7 tells us why we have to do this. Because they're going out in the name of Jesus, and because they're going out in the name of Jesus, Jesus pagans are not going to help them. Pagans are not going to help them. So in remember 2 John, how I talked about if someone with a different set of gospel or, or somebody that is a deceiver, someone that is anti-truth comes your way, like you don't open your door to them. You don't help them push that down the road. Well, it kind of falls on the flip side, too. Because if you're going out there in the name of Jesus, pagans are going to look at you and be like, this guy's crazy. We're not helping him. I mean, it's a spiritual battle here. So who's going to help? How's this going to work? The body of Christ. So we're going to open our hearts, our doors, our resources. We're going to help each other out. So that way we move the name of Jesus forward. And in verse 8, we ought to therefore show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. See, guys, it's all, it, we're all in this thing together as a church. And I know so many people were like, man, Ricky, like, I, I'm not called to that. You're, you're called to hospitality, especially if it comes to believers, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reason why we do this is because of what verse 4 told us. Because verse 4 talked about walking in truth, connecting your belief with your conduct so way people could see it. You know, the other night I was uh, reading a book with Livy. You know, we always do leche and books before we go to bed. Uh, sometimes it puts me to bed. But, but, but uh, Livy has this little booklet that we started reading. And... Um, and what I would do is it would be like, so-and-so goes to the park. John, you know, it would say John. John goes to the park. John has a picnic. John has plates. So what I'll do is I will point to the picture and li I'll tell Livy, Livy, you have to tell me what this word is. So I'm like, John has, she's like, plates. And, and I was like, you're reading, you know. And, and then, so we'll do the whole book like that. John has cups. John has a picnic. John is happy. And we'll just keep doing that. And then I remember, like, we finished the books, like, seven pages. And I was like, Liv, you're so smart. How, how did you get so smart? You already know how to read. And she looks at me. And she's like, well, Daddy, you can see it. <laughs> and I was like, thanks. Thanks for shooting me down. Awesome. <laughs> oh. But, but it's true. It's like. She knows because she's able to see it. Now, if I were to just read it to her, she wouldn't know what's coming. She wouldn't know what I'm articulating because she can't see it. See, so what hospitality does is that it alerts other believers because they're able to see it. So you don't have to, like, say anything. Like, they know. I mean, I, I do this all the time. Like, when I see, like, friends that are pastors or people that I've met in other states and and, and I look on social media, and I know they're coming through, like, the DFW. I'm like, bro, like, come through Fort Worth. I'll show you a good time. Like, I want you to come to my house. Like, we'll put you in a hotel. Like, man, like, you, you want to come preach at the church? Like, we'll cook for you. I know some people that could cook pretty good, right? <laughs> like, come through. Like, it's exciting because we want to be a part of this. We want to be a part of pushing the truth forward. And that's what hospitality does. So just to end our time today, I just want to just point four quick things out based on this text about hospitality. And my prayer is that we start having a different view on hospitality, that we start looking at our own selves and we start looking at the bigger picture of God. So number one, hospitality shows your understanding of the kingdom. Hospitality shows your understanding of the kingdom. If we look at Verse 5, you know, John is telling guys, he's like, man, you are faithful. 
because of what you're doing for the, brothers, for the brothers and sisters, even though they're strangers to you. Unless you understand something that's way bigger, you're not going to just open your house up to strangers and believers you don't know. And what Gaius understands is that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than what's in front of him right now. The kingdom of God is massive. And he's like, I want to be a part of this thing. So I want to ask you, what's your understanding of God's kingdom? And can I tell your understanding of God's kingdom by the way you show hospitality to people? Like, let me ask you, like, when was the last time you had somebody come to your house? Like a believer? Like maybe somewhere from the church? I don't know. When was the last time you offered something to somebody? Like, like think about that. Like, I want to be a part of, of, I want to be a part of God's kingdom. I want, to, I want to be a part of God's stuff, like big stuff. But if you're going to do that, you've got to have a bigger view, a bigger picture, a bigger perspective in your mind that God's kingdom is bigger than myself, that God's kingdom is bigger than my resources, it's bigger than my wallet, and it's bigger than my refrigerator. I will give you whatever I have in my house. If I got fruit snacks, you can have my fruit snacks. If I got a little bit of orange juice, I'll put a little bit of water in it and give you some. <laughs> Thank God for DoorDash, right? Like, <laughs> whatever it is I got, you could have it. Because God's kingdom is bigger than my pride. And I, and I want you guys to understand that, man, if we could just get this through our minds and say it's not about me, it's about the kingdom of God, it's about pushing the gospel forward, it's about discipleship and growing people, and even to the point where you could just have all my stuff. I don't care. Let the Lord use it. But you know the crazy thing about when you, start, when you make up your mind and you're like, it's about God's kingdom and not my kingdom, you also get God's kingdom benefits and not world kingdom benefits. Because in God's kingdom, that's where the supernatural lives. Here in this world is where the natural lives. And there's some things that only God can do that only God can do. And until you take a step into the supernatural and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with my stuff. I'm going to let any, any brother and sister need it. I got you. Like, I'm open my door. To, I don't know. I don't have much. But whatever it is, you're going to start seeing God open blessing on your life that you will never understand. And some of you guys are like, man, Ricky, well, I'm always broke. I was like, yeah, you are because you're in the wrong kingdom. That's why you're struggling. Trust the Lord. And watch him provide. All right, number two. What else do we understand? Hospitality is not task driven. It is God honoring. Being hospitable is not about checking a box. It's not about I'm doing this because I have to. I'm doing this because I must. Because when you do things that are task driven, you only do the bare minimum to get it done. That's the culture we live in today. Like, there's this weird culture right now of, like, I'm worth more than what you're giving me. Like, like you earned something. I'm like, you haven't done anything yet. That, that's, that's not a very good mentality to have. But... If I know that I'm honoring the Lord by how I welcome believers and how I serve servants of the Lord and how I help push the gospel forward, I'm actually honoring the Lord by giving my best foot forward and my best efforts all the time. And God will honor it back. You know, one of the reasons why we always have breakfast here on Sunday, because we don't have to. Because it's God honoring. We bring the best every single time, no matter the cost, no matter our resources, whatever it is, we do the best we can because we want to make sure that people, believers, brothers and sisters of Christ come in this place and you feel welcomed, you feel at home, and that you don't leave hungry, that you don't have any excuse. There's food back there. We got you. 
But we don't do it because we're forced to. We do it because it honors the Lord. And we want to honor the Lord with our best effort every single time. Now, if it was a checkbox, if it was something I'm supposed to do, then I'll just go buy a, a box of zebra cakes and, and put them back there. <laughs> I, I like the people that say amen are struggling, you know. <laughs> Uh, they're struggling hard, man. They're like, whatever it takes. <laughs> I mean, we'll make some tang together. Like, I said, chill out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man. That's right. You see, Rita. God honoring, Rita. So, you know, it's not about the task. It's about the heart behind hospitality. So we want to honor God what we have. All right, next one. Hospitality shows your faith. Hospitality shows your faith. So verse 6, um, so just to go back one, you know, the, the reason why we say it honors God is because of verse, what verse 6 says, please send them their way, please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. And then go to verse 7. Why does it show your faith? Because it says in verse 7, it was for the sake of the name that they went out receiving no help from pagans. You see, as these folks would go out, as they would go and, and, and preach the gospel, and as they would go and spread the word, they weren't receiving any help from anybody else. So as God would call them to go out and go to places and start churches, they had no idea how they were going to get there. They had no idea where they were going to stay with. They had no idea where they were going. They had no idea how they were going to eat. They went because God called them to go. <clears throat> and what John is saying is that he's like, because they're going in the name of Jesus. See that, that in verse 7, name is capitalized. In the name of Jesus, they're not going to receive any help from pagans. So if God is calling me to go to some town, I don't know if there's believers there or not. So where, where am I going to get my help? Where am I going to stay? Where, how am I going to eat? So they're going in faith. You see, so as you show your hospitality, what you're doing is that you're actually showing your faith. You're not just showing faith, but you're also showing the kind of faith that you have. What kind of faith you got? Because hospitality is also tied to generosity. And if you struggle with giving, you're going to struggle with hospitality. Because even though you might not have much, Physically, you do have time, you do have talents, you do have effort, and you do have a way to offer hospitality, even without the stuff. But that requires a faith that sometimes many of us need help with. And then the last one, and we'll close with this. Hospitality is used to move the gospel forward. Hospitality is moved to... Move, is used to move the gospel forward. You know, one of the greatest tools I believe that, that we do not utilize enough is hospitality. Because there are ways that you have people who are, are, are on their way or they're doing something where they're preaching and, and you could somehow connect them with non-believers because your hospitality is so good. Somebody might not come to church, but you could grill the mess out of some meat. And if you invite them to your house, they will come. And if you invite other folks to your house, they will come. And if they happen to come at the same exact time, there might be some conversation started. See, guys, God uses this to bring the non-believers, bring people who are lost and hurting and hopeless to connect with hope, which is the name that they are spreading throughout the nation. We need to start looking at our hospitality in a different light. And if we can do that, we're going to start seeing some shifts in our culture. 
So times have changed, and I hope that you do too. Let's pray together.